did it. Uh, uh, so, um, oh, okay, yep, for recording, no problem. Uh, yeah, so um, just a few comments before I get started. One is I think it's great what you're doing uh, with yeah. this club. Um, I, I, it's something I wish so we had something like this at Sabancha, actually. We, we don't right now. There's been a little bit of talk about it, but um, it's great to see, you know, students taking initiative and getting together and, you know, sharing their common interest and uh, passion for biology, really. And so that's something that uh, I really value and, and try to encourage with the students I work with, you know, at Sabancha and that are involved in the projects. And I work with quite a few undergraduates uh, over the years at different institutions, and I really have a lot of fun uh, working with undergraduates. Uh, so uh, thanks very much for the invitation. I hope you find the, the talk uh, interesting. Uh, but again, I like, I like to see what you're doing, and I've given a number of talks to uh, student-focused you know, conferences and, and things like that around Turkey since I've arrived, and I really enjoyed them. Uh, mostly because they're very well organized. Uh, the students organize them and they do a great job. So, um, all right, I'm going to uh, get to the good stuff here. So the, the talk. And I picked this topic. I did ask, you know, what would be of much, most interest uh, given my different research areas. And uh, I was told that there was an interest for more of a, um, ecological organismal uh, focus. Um, and so for that reason, I decided to uh, stick with one of my longtime interests, which is the evolution of social behavior and then using bees to better understand this. So this focuses on a little bit older uh, research. Uh, some of it's quite new, but there's some older research too that I did in my postdoc and PhD work uh, which had a more of an organismal focus and a more ecological focus. So I'll try to highlight that uh, some throughout the talk. And what you see here are three very different looking bee species, but in fact, these are actually fairly closely related. And uh, despite this, they have very different lifestyles. So the mason bee here is a solitary bee and we have the bumblebee, which is considered to be semi-social, and then the honeybee over here, which is considered to be eusocial, uh, so the most social. And uh, what this highlights is that we can use uh, comparative studies, so comparative investigations. We can compare across these different bee species, and uh, with this comparison, we can understand maybe some of the mechanisms that might lead to the evolution of social behavior. So it pre presents an opportunity, a framework to, to work from. And in fact, bees have been studied heavily to try to under better understand uh, social behavior, the, the mechanisms behind it, as well as how it's evolved. And so for today's talk, I will focus mostly on the honeybee, but I have a long-term interest in eventually doing comparative work to you know, understand the metabolic factors involved in the evolution of social behavior. So the outline for today's talk, since it is fairly long, uh, I'd like to, to do an outline to, to give you an idea of the directions that I'm going in. And first topic that I will cover is focusing on why the evolution of social behavior is fascinating. So this may be a bit different topic from what you're used to. I notice here in Turkey, some of the uh, biology programs focus maybe on more molecular work. Uh, so I'd like to spend some time on that of explaining why it's fascinating to other scientists as well as of course myself. And then we'll go into uh, how to go about studying the evolution of social behavior, um, <clears throat> the strategies that we use. And then from this, I'll give you a few examples of studies that I've conducted that focus on more of the, what's called the proximate mechanism point of view. I'll explain what that is. Uh, and then lastly, I'll give you some examples that uh, I've conducted or been involved in that focuses both on the proximate and ultimate levels of investigation. So both levels of investigation that can be conducted 
when you think about uh, or investigate social behavior. So first of all, what is social behavior, right? So social behavior is defined as uh, an interaction of uh, um, you know, members of a, a species with another member of that same species. So you have interactions among uh, members of the same species. And we see that this has evolved multiple times throughout evolutionary history. And many times it's the social behavior that's attributed to the species success and their ability to outcompete other species. Uh, and so they appear to have a, a competitive advantage. And so we see different examples, right? So we have wolves here uh, cooperating and hunting together as a pack. Uh, <clears throat> there's schools of fish that will uh, interact with one another to say form um, a congregation to avoid predation. We have an extreme of highly social behavior, an extreme case here of ants um, <clears throat> working together here to form a bridge, right, to help with uh, foraging efforts. We have penguins, again, that form some sort of collective behavior, uh, and well, as well as these uh, Komodo dragons. So we see it in diverse taxa. And uh, for this reason, it's uh, quite fascinating to investigate because it's evolved multiple times, and we see it in across diverse uh, kinds of, of species and environments. And of course, humans are highly social as well. So naturally, we're curious about uh, how and, and why social behavior has evolved, because we are highly social too. And um, <clears throat> this is one of the key attributes that sets humans apart from many different kinds of organisms. And again, it's attributed to the success of, of humans as a species as well. So this social behavior was actually quite difficult for Darwin to uh, explain uh, in the context of natural selection. So if you think of natural selection where mainly the, the mechanisms behind it lead to the maximum fitness of an individual, um, it was hard for Darwin to explain why an individual would incur a cost to help another individual. In other words, it would sacrifice some of its fitness benefits on an individual level to, in order to increase the fitness benefits of another individual. So um, <clears throat> one behavior we see a lot with social behavior is altruism. And this is defined when it, there is a net cost to an individual and then another individual benefits. So like I was talking about before, and again, this is hard for Darwin to define. So if we think about this example here and we try to make sense of it, here we have scrub jays and with these scrub jays, the uh, siblings here, the older siblings will tend to stay behind and help raise the next generation of, of offspring, which you see here. And again, they're occurring a cost um, they're getting no fitness advantage from this because it's not their offspring. And usually we define fitness as reproductive output. So the more reproductive output you have in a lifetime, the higher fitness you have. But if we look at the context that this is in and the ecological constraints that exist, uh, it makes starts to make more sense of why we see this cooperative behavior. So if a scrub jay sibling uh, is say one year old and tries to go off and start its own nest and reproduce on its own, the fitness benefits are zero. So it's not able to succeed. So instead it's thought if it stays behind and helps raise the siblings, indirectly it can gain some fitness uh, by some of the shared genes that are passed on by these, by these offspring. Uh, so what this, example highlights is that under certain ecological conditions, it makes adaptive sense, or it makes sense to increase fitness somehow uh, if <clears throat> altruism is occurring. So a lot of times this is asked in this example here, why should offspring stay and help its parents to raise their young instead of going out and trying to reproduce on their own? So this can be better explained or it's more formally explained with 
what's known as the occlusive fitness theory. So this is best illustrated by this diagram here to the right, where if we think about not maximizing the fitness at an individual level, but instead the genes that are driving this, these behaviors, um, then we can start to uh, learn that there's a possibility of gaining indirect fitness as well as direct fitness. So the direct fitness here uh, is gained from reproduction. So that's what you're probably more familiar with, with natural selection. Um, as the reproduction goes up, the fitness goes up. But what can also happen is indirect fitness can be gained, and that's the benefits of helping out a closely related individual. So that's what this R stands for here. So the more closely related you are to an individual, the more indirect fitness gains you can get by helping out that individual. So you can see why maybe the scrub jays would stay behind if we consider uh, inclusive fitness. So this theory came after Darwin's work and it includes both direct and indirect fitness to get you the total fitness gain of the individual. So it's a, it's a modification of Darwin's work. And <clears throat> this was brought about by W.D. Hamilton. And he's uh, very famous in the field of animal behavior and behavioral ecology uh, because he came up with this as well as Hamilton's rule in kin selection. So he was the first one to come up with a theory to actually explain Darwin's conundrum where he couldn't, you know, uh, understand why animals were performing altruism. Uh, so here he has stated that if the benefits outweigh the cost, then the behavior will result in an increase in fitness. And so with Hamilton's rule, the modification is he added this relatedness factor. And so if the benefits times the relatedness outweigh the cost, then the behavior will be sustained because it increases fitness. Um, so you can see if, again, if the individual is highly related to the other individual, then they may be more likely to perform altruism. And we actually see this in a number of examples. And when it's done with a family member, it's known as kin selection, okay? And so <clears throat> kin selection uh, favors behaviors that will help other individuals that are highly related, other family members. Um, so they'll incur a cost on their direct fitness, but gain indirect fitness from their actions. And you can see that here, all right, in these birds, that with this particular bird species, as the relatedness goes up, the probability of helping that individual also goes up. So we do see evidence of that. And the key here is this relatedness factor that, that tips the scales. <clears throat> now, that the theory helps explain you know, why it is that we would see altruism and, and social behavior, you know, a lot of cooperation, interaction among the same species. Um, <clears throat> and this is useful for answering what we know as ultimate questions. So these are more long-term questions or the why questions that you can ask about a particular behavior. Um, so we went over these three points that help explain why it is that we would see social behavior or altruistic behavior. All right, along with Hamilton's rule, rule. So these are pretty well established and, and well studied. And now what much research is focusing on is more the proximate questions. And so this focuses on how it is that social behavior can occur. So the how questions or what are the mechanisms, underlying mechanisms that uh, allow for or facilitate social behavior. So there's two main hypotheses that <clears throat> have been put forth. One is unique genes are responsible for the social behavior that we see. Uh, and then the other, which appears to be probably more likely is that there's some sort of change in highly conserved genes or highly conserved pathways that then facilitate the evolution of social behavior. Uh, so in other words, there's tweaking or co-opting of particular pathways that have already existed in, say, solitary ancestry that 
uh, allow or, or give rise to or facilitate social behavior. And what I have here on the right is a diagram showing the comparisons of genomes to highlight the fact that we're with these new newer molecular tools with say genomics, transcriptomics, um, and other <clears throat> and other tools, we're we're beginning to have the the necessary information to to start to really focus in on the the proximate questions. So as I pointed out before, honeybees are extremely social, and many studies have focused on the benefits of being social. So this leads to increased efficiency and productivity. Uh, honeybees, because of their highly social behavior, have better defense against disease and predators. Um, however, uh, with these benefits, they're likely to be there's they're likely to have <clears throat> the bee individual bees are likely to have some costs as well. So usually what we see with particular traits and behaviors is that there are certain trade-offs. So if they become good in one area, then they're likely to not be as good in another area. Um, and what I'm really fascinated with is um, how the highly social behavior might lead to physiological constraints at the individual level uh, especially when bees are responding to hunger, energetic stress. Uh, so their physiology could be really shaped by the, the group as a whole uh, for proficient collective behavior, but then they might be less likely to or less able to buffer against stressors at the individual level. Uh, and that might be a cost um, to this highly social behavior. So that's what my research focuses on. And <clears throat> And the framework for that work is shown here. And I'm focusing on energetic stress or hunger. And so in a solitary in insect, they can respond in two different ways. They can, uh, or they typically release octopamine, which is a hormone as well as a dipokinetic hormone. And these can target the brain and the fat body and elicit two different uh, responses. So one is hyperactivity or increased search activity for food. And this is known as more of a behavioral response, and it's primarily um, driven by octopamine. And then there's a physiological response, which is the mobilization of fat, of fat stores. So both strategies can help uh, ameliorate energetic stress. Uh, and one is more of a physiological response, and the other one is more behavioral. So what I've done is used octopamine, octopamine and adipokinetic hormone as proxies for measuring these different responses. And I hypothesize that in a social insect that over evolutionary time, they've actually lost the, the physiological response and they rely on behavior more so or searching for food to, um, to cure their energetic stress or ameliorate the energetic stress. So in order to test this, I focus on these two different hormones and started in the honeybee, but then would like to study this in other bee species as well. So some of the results that I found is, in fact, if we look across different honeybees, uh, so these are three different age classes, the forager being the older one, we see at least in the forager class, there is uh, an increase in octopamine in the, in the bee brain as they're, they're starved. Uh, so there is uh, a response in the direction that I thought might be the case. And then also if we look at adipokinetic hormone, and these are in forager bees, whether they're stressed with an infection or they're starved with an infection, in any of these cases here, we see no significant difference in the gene expression of adipokinetic hormone. So it suggests that there may be indeed a loss of response of adipokinetic hormone or it's no longer functional uh, in the honeybee and they can no longer use this to aid in <clears throat> responding to energetic stress. And so some first findings that we, uh, I'd like to point out is that we do find some evidence for uh, my initial hypotheses here. So at least octopamine increases with the forager bees as appetite increases uh, due to starvation, but not a dipokinetic hormone. 
Um, and this is unlike what we see in solitary insects. And this is just one example of how these hormones, which are driving highly conserved metabolic pathways, uh, could be altered to give rise to social behavior, right? How they, how they might be altered. And <clears throat> although this supports the initial hypothesis that I generated, it still needs to be explicitly tested across the bee species uh, in order to investigate if this is associated with the level of social behavior that we see in bees. So <clears throat> this lends itself to uh, pursuing a comparative physiology approach, which I'd like to do in the near future. Um, <clears throat> right now we're investigating uh, the relationship between octopamine and, and appetite and sugar levels in the hemolymph in the honeybees. So we're further investigating that. And then after that, I plan to hopefully be able to capture different bee species and uh, be able to starve them and see if it's, if it's actually the case. So if they're more social, do they uh, tend to respond uh, with octopamine over a dipokinetic hormone in comparison to the less social bee species? So you can see we, have a, we can establish a gradient of, of social behavior and see how the response varies across that gradient. And so bees provide a nice uh, opportunity to do this because there's many different bee species and th there's different sets of uh, varying social levels uh, with, with highly related bee species, which uh, is ideal for doing comparative work. So now I'll highlight a few other ways that social behavior can be studied. Um, and <clears throat> Right now, we've, we've focused on genes or highly conserved pathways, proximate mechanisms that can uh, be altered to give rise to social behavior. So now I'll give a few examples, go over a few examples of how both the proximate and ultimate uh, explanations of social behavior can be investigated. And one of the other areas that I was quite interested in, and I I'm still think it's fascinating, is how individuals and societies resolve conflicts of interest when they're under stress. So do individual bees perform uh, decisions that are in the best interest of themselves when they're stressed, or do they maintain behavioral decisions that are in the best interest of the group that they're living in? So decisions that are for the greater good, uh, so to speak. So <clears throat> one example can be, in, in this context, can, that can be investigated is uh, best described um, as <clears throat> with the risk sensitivity theory and the energy budget rule. Right? And so this can be uh, described with this foraging scenario sh shown here, where we have a forager bee leaving the hive, and it has a choice between two different flower patches, in this case, and the blue flowers here, represented by these circles, are much more variable in terms of the nectar that they have, but they give a, a mean of two nectar units. And then the yellow flowers here are, you can see, are much more consistent. So they have no variance. All of the flowers have two nectar units. And the mean payoff of this flower patch is the same uh, with two nectar units. So, it's uh, predicted by this energy budget rule, the risk sensitivity theory, that an individual bee, if they're on a positive energy budget, which means they're not at risk of starvation, they should actually prefer to be what's known as risk averse and go to the more consistent flower patch. Uh, so <clears throat> no need to take a risk of getting nothing from a flower and expending that energy. Uh, when not at risk of starvation. Now, if the bee is on a negative energy budget, it's predicted to actually, that it's adaptive or it's best for its fitness to go to the more variable food patch. And the reason for that is because uh, the foraging time is limited, so it might as well take a risk of getting four, the high reward in this case, um, 
uh, because it, if it doesn't get this high reward, then it'll starve to death by the end of the foraging period. Um, so this is predicted that these bees, if they're acting in their own self-interest, should actually um, change uh, this behavior as they, as they starve over time. So in order to test this, um, <clears throat> we use this uh, setup here, which in which instead of different flower colors, we could use different odors and we could train the bees to learn a, both a variable and a constant uh, reward distribution. In other words, you can see that there's a harness bee here that's placed in the center and in a series of puffs of odor, these two different odors, hexanol and octanone, are puffed at the bee at 45 degree angles. And if the bee turns its head towards the left in response to the hexanol, I gave a 0.2 microliter reward of sugar water um, all of the time. And then if it turned its head to the right towards octanone in response to that, I would give it zero microliters, so nothing, or 0.4 microliters of <clears throat> sugar water. And this would be considered the, the more variable reward distribution with the high and low reward that's given. So we do this a number of times and the bees can actually associate, we'll make an association. This is known as classical conditioning, like with Pavlov's dog. Uh, they'll make an association, you know, that the hexanol represents a constant reward and the octanone represents the variable reward. So this is an example. The quality isn't the best, um, but it's better than nothing. So this is an example of a learning trial where after the odor comes, I give that sugar water. So the beep there is the beginning. The trial, you can see it's sticking out its proboscis indicating where it would like to feed from. So it's already started to make an association. And so it's towards the left there in that case. And so I gave the corresponding reward. Now, after they did this a number of times, I then manipulated their energy budget. So I had them starve over time and then tested what their preference was by just presenting the odor because I didn't want to manipulate or change their energy budget. Um, <clears throat> didn't want to mess up their starvation schedule. So I could rely on their memory. They, they formed a memory uh, and determine what their preference was as they starved over time. An example of that is shown here. So I don't deliver, continue delivering the sugar water or the unconditioned stimulus in this case. I just deliver the odor and I see what their preference is at this time. So this was done every six hours for 24 hours. And you can see that the B here clearly is preferring the odor coming from the right, um, indicating that, that preference. So the data from that are shown here. And I used trailose, which is a sugar in the bee's hemolymph to confirm or to indicate the energy budget. So the bees that were starving over time are indicated in red, the trailose levels are declining. And then I did uh, <clears throat> the opposite as a control. So bees were gaining energy over time. So they're being fed over time and their trailose levels uh, increased. And from these two different energy budget manipulations, we have the um, proportion of constant choices made. So if they prefer the more constant option or the risk averse option. So if that's the case, then um, those preferences are indicated as being above the 0.5 line. If it's below the 0.5 line, it indicates the bees prefer the more variable food option or the more risk prone food option. And so very um, <clears throat> interestingly enough, we do see as the bees start on a positive energy budget, they're risk averse, preferring the more constant option. And then as they starve, they switch over to a risk prone foraging strategy and prefer the more variable option. And the opposite is true for the bees starting out on a negative energy budget and then increasing to a positive energy budget. So this confirmed the energy budget rule, the risk sensitivity theory, which is somewhat controversial at the time. And then also it shows that 
these bees are able to <clears throat> change their behavior on an individual level, um, independent from the, the status of the colony. Okay, so if they're stressed enough, then they will switch over to a strategy that's most beneficial for them on an individual level. Another ex example that we investigated involved uh, studying self-control. So the, the opposite of self uh, of self control is being impulsive. Uh, so we see these behaviors in humans as well. And both for humans and honeybees, it's hypothesized that a high level of self-control is needed because self-control correlates with a lot of behaviors that are good for uh, cooperativeness and functioning as a society. So <clears throat> what we see here is I used the uh, same setup. Uh, so I was able to use the same setup I showed you to train bees to associate an odor with a small, smaller, more immediate reward, and then a larger, more delayed reward. So that was their two options. And again, I starved them over time after they learn these two different food reward distributions and then noted their preferences, again, by just presenting odor, just like what I showed you before. And what we see here is that if there's no delay, um, as you would expect, the bees, uh, which is shown in green, prefer the larger reward. Um, so this, this makes sense, right? The bees are able to discriminate and prefer the larger versus the smaller food reward, uh, which makes sense. But interestingly enough, if there is a delay, uh, as the bees starve, they actually prefer, start to prefer the smaller, more immediate reward over the larger, more delayed reward, uh, even though that the payoff uh, is the same. Uh, so this is a measure of the bees losing self-control and this also correspond, corresponded with an increase in dopamine in the bee brain, which is the same uh, that we see in humans, which suggests that maybe this is a highly conserved uh, mechanism uh, in which an individual loses self-control. And when this happens, usually the, the contracts of society break down quite quickly. So, the example I like to give is, <clears throat> you know, humans in a zombie apocalypse, right? So pretty quickly, uh, humans start to look out for themselves uh, on an individual level, as opposed to thinking about the greater good or, or making decisions for the best interest of society. Um, so we see some evidence of that in honeybees as well. So when they're really stressed, energetically, they can start to, again, make more uh, selfish uh, decisions in this case as well. So what this highlights is that there appears to be uh, <clears throat> some uh, individual behaviors, even though they're highly social, some pathways that uh, will elicit uh, uh, behaviors that are best for the individual. And then there appears to be another level of regulatory mechanisms that might uh, encourage them or facilitate this, this social behavior. <clears throat> so we, we could really dictate with these uh, few studies at what level of stress do honeybees go into this self or sur survival mode. Um, <clears throat> so it is considered to be adaptive actually uh, when the bees are starved to prefer the risk prone or risky option um, it's shown to actually increase their survival chances at an individual level. And <clears throat> we also see that under severe starvation, even though the honeybees typically maintain self-control, um, they can lose this, this self-control and uh, perform uh, actions that are not in the interest of the colony as a whole. So the last example that I'd like to share with you is uh, from some recent work that I find to be uh, you know, really interesting, I think. Uh, and this is actually an undergraduate led project. This is a project that um, the undergraduate 
developed the idea on her own and was the lead on the project. And then other undergraduates helped her with this research. And this is research coming from Swarthmore College where I was uh, before for a few years before I joined uh, Savancha University. So what we see here is um, a diagram illustrating collective decision-making and what's essential for it is both negative and positive feedback. So collective decision-making is decision-making process that relies on multiple individuals and multiple inputs. So what's analogous to this is neurons in the brain that are taking multiple inhibitory and an excitatory um, signals. And from there, they're, they're, an action is being made um, or you know, do you, perhaps you get transmission with that neuron. Um, if there's enough excitatory in, uh, inputs that, that overcome the inhibitory ones. So here we can think of this, um, what the undergraduate was interested in is make a comparison with the beehive with the human brain and seeing if honeybees have both positive and negative feedback and do they behave collectively similar to neurons in a, in a human brain. Um, so you can see here there's some self-organized relationships and interactions, but it's primarily driven by these feedback loops here. And eventually um, what can emerge from this is a complex adaptive behavior on a collective level. So at a, at a group level uh, that's emerging from many small inputs from individual levels. And this is usually in response to a changing environment. Um, so, you know, how does, the, how does the colony as a whole respond to a change in, in the environment? Can they adapt to that change? So <clears throat> uh, you're probably familiar with the positive feedback that honeybees use. So this is known as the waggle dance. They use this to recruit other bees to go out and forage and they communicate with this waggle dance how far the bee has to fly and in what direction they have to fly to find the food. And so this is known as recruitment. So they go to the dance floor, it's actually called the dance floor in the beehive, and they do their waggle dance and uh, get other bees to join them and go out uh, foraging from the hive. So this is known as positive feedback because you're increasing the numbers of foragers. And <clears throat> what's been recently found is what's known as a stop signal, and this is negative feedback. So the stop signal is elicited to a dancing bee to tell them to stop dancing, uh, to no longer recruit individuals to that food source. And it's been shown in the context of uh, <clears throat> predation. So if a bee is attacked or uh, predated upon, um, the bee, other bees or that individual bee will come back to the hive and give these stop signals uh, to get the bee to stop dancing. And so we hypothesize that if there's a, sharp decline in the profitability of food uh, that they might also use the stop signal to uh, get bees to quickly stop recruiting for that food source and then they can allocate the foraging force to some other place that might be more beneficial. So we, we, we are able to investigate this and I'll give you an example here of this stop signal. It's an auditory signal and it's elicited by a bee. Um, and you can see here, in this case, we use a microphone to amplify this. It's, it's hard to hear without, without a microphone. So we use a microphone and amplifier and then headphones to be able to hear it. And this stick here has, has the headphone on, or sorry, has the microphone on the end of it. And we're following marked bees. So these are bees that we know are foragers and are visiting our feeder outside and <clears throat> After they're trained to this feeder, we reduce the concentration of sugar water dramatically. Um, and then we, inside the hive, this is an observation hive, we're looking at the number of waggle dances as well as the, the feeder visitations um, and the uh, number of stop signals that are being elicited. So here's an example of that. So you can hear the hum of the hive. So I'm following this bee here who's, that's waggle dancing, does figure eight pattern. It's typical waggle dancing. You hear the vibration. 
on the microphone. I'm narrating it. This is stop signal. So you can hear that, right? The beep. That's yes. the stop signal. It's this abrupt auditory signal. So there's vibrations with this as well. And we could actually see that the bees would stop a little bit or take a pause after they got the stop signal sometimes. So you can see other bees are, are waggle dancing to other food sources. But we, we, fo we did focal observations of these bees. And that just gives you an idea how we recorded the behavioral data again. Now, again, we, we also did some computational neuronal modeling of <clears throat> um, uh, to compare the, the feedback dynamics to see if it was similar to how uh, neurons in the brain collectively arrive at a decision. So if you're a human is deciding between option A and B, and it's a hard decision, there's positive and negatory, negative inhibitory um, inputs, and collectively your neurons come to that decision and, and make that decision. Um, so that was done as well. And to show you what we found here, at first, um, <clears throat> We noticed that the decline in food quality, which is indicated here at the 50th minute, this dotted line, um, caused actually an increase in the visits uh, from the trained bees in comparison to the controlled treatment. Um, so this is counterintuitive. This is surprising. We actually saw an increase in the number of visits to the lower quality uh, feeder. And how we could explain this from our observations is actually because these bees spent less time dancing and trying to recruit other bees. So they had more time to go foraging and they had more um, time to make more visits to the feeder. Um, so that was surprising, but we, we were able to explain that with some observations. And then um, here we noticed that recruited bees to the feeders continue to increase, but not with the poor quality feeder switch. So that again supports the idea, it's just the mark bees, the, the bees that are already trained. There's no real new bees being recruited, um, which is responsible for the increased visits to, to the uh, feeder after it's been switched. So at this 50 minute mark, we switch the 2.5 molar feeder with another 2.5 molar feeder as a control and then for the treatment, which you see here in purple, we switched the 2.5 molar feeder to a 0.75 molar feeder. <clears throat> so a decline in, in sugar water quality. And here is, uh, to me, the most interesting results where we see, which we demonstrate for the first time that bees are using a stop signal to decrease the, uh, the forger recruitment. So this waggle dance here was discovered by Carl von Frisch and which you saw in the, in the earlier slide studying the bees and that won him a Nobel prize. And so we found basically the opposite function here to the, to, to the waggle dance, which is first shown to be used for recruitment for food. And what we see is a decline in the waggle dances right after the switch with the lower quality feeder that's maintained or increases a little bit as you would expect with a high quality feeder. And that corresponds here, this is the cumulative number of stop signals produced. You can see right after that switch, pretty immediately within a 10 minute window or so, there's a jump in stop signals elicited. And there's overall more stop signals elicited um, to the <clears throat> bees that experienced uh, a decline in, in food, food quality. So we also found that this matched the, uh, the brain um, simulations that we ran and is similar to how the neurons behave in the brain, in the human brain, and uh, when it comes time to, to make a decision. So what we can take away from this is it appears that there's two different 
regulatory mechanisms for honeybee foraging. Again, one at the individual level that dictates the number of foraging trips. And then there's one at a more group level, which is um, in respect to recruitment via the waggle dance um, that's used to recruit bees. So recruitment's at a social level, foraging frequency appears to be controlled at an individual level. Um, so these support the notion that, um, again, there's two different regulatory levels, an individual and social one, and probably through evolutionary history, they've been co-opted together uh, mechanistically uh, to give rise to the social behavior that we see in honeybees. So with that, um, <clears throat> I'd just like to thank some of the, uh, my PhD advisors. So these are students or individuals involved in the work that you saw here today. My PhD advisor is Drew Benog from Colorado State University. And then these are a number of undergraduates who helped me with, with some of the work that you saw today. Um, at Martin Luther University, the physiology work was um, thanks to uh, my collaborators there during my postdoc. And then at Swarthmore College, it focused on the, the last study that you saw there. And there was a number of undergraduates involved in that work. And then um, the appetite regulation project that I talked about that I'm investigating now is with the help of some collaborators from Arizona State University. Um, so with that, um, I also like to thank the, the funding sources as well. Uh, along with your attention, hopefully my timing was okay. I hope so. Well, well, it was, it definitely was. Well, thank you very much for the seminar as well. Um, if you actually uh, have some more time, uh, we would actually go on some questions. Sure. Perhaps. Um, so the listeners, you can take this as a call out. I shall now start asking a few questions that I have in my mind, but sure. the, please feel free to um, write in the chat or maybe raise your hand through the Zoom interface to open your microphones. So um, once again, thank you very much for the uh, seminar, Professor Mayak. I am very much interested in the hierarchy that is within a beehive. So like the queen bee and the worker bees. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, as a, like, and, and not, uh, how can I say this? So I have seen like when they are cultivating beehives or when they are beekeeping, like people when they beekeep, um, there seems to be either an acceptance or a rejection towards the queen that is introduced to a hive. So what is the interaction? What is the social behavior between a worker bee and the queen bee so that they either get along well or they do not? Mm -hmm. Very good question. Yeah, so um, it's, it's driven a lot by pheromones actually. So bees are uh, really reliant upon smell. They're very sensitive to smell and their smell is much better than their vision uh, in terms of you know, sensory information. And so it's driven by pheromones. Now, what's interesting with beekeepers and how they get around this is if you have a foreign queen, yeah, if you put it in a hive, especially with the uh, Turkish bees, the uh, Anatolian subspecies, they're, they're on the aggressive side, in my opinion. Um, they're not uh, quite as aggressive as um, African, uh, Africanized bees. Um, but uh, nonetheless, more so than the bees I have experience with in, in Europe and the US. Uh, and they will, they will attack and kill the queen, okay? And, and recognize her as an intruder, a foreigner. But um, what beekeepers do is they put the queen in a cage uh, with a few attendants from the original colony and they plug that with bee candy. And it takes the bees a couple of days to eat through that candy from either end. And once they do, the queen can be released. And within that time, so the cage allows the other bees to smell the queen, but not interact with her. And the bees get used to her smell. And then after a couple of days, they will accept her. If there's no other queen in the colony, they will accept her as their queen and take care of her. And she will start laying 
in the colony and uh, yeah, and that's how you introduce uh, a new queen if you need one as a beekeeper. Um, yeah, so it's, and, and the same can be done with bees. It's very interesting. If you take bees outside the hive for a while, for say a couple days, and you keep them in the laboratory in a cage, for example, their smell will change. And then you try to put them back into their same hive, they will be rejected as foreigners, as intruders. And I see. Attacked. I see. Thank you very much. Because it, it, it like I, I, I prepared this so much that I, I kind of feel like I'm bombarding you at the moment. But oh no, it's okay. Yeah, fire away. Fire away. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so the thing with the queens are like, um, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, my uh, technical knowledge is very limited on the topic. Uh, they are treated. They are fed with the royal jelly. And uh, the ones that are to be fed with royal jelly, are they determined by the worker bees? Like which function within the hive determines which larva to be fed with um, the royal jelly and the others to be of lesser contents? Yeah, you know, I get, I get asked this question a lot uh, by students and it's a fascinating question. And, and in fact, there's a, a collaborator at Ulda University who does a lot of bee research and, and he wanted to do royal jelly proposal recently you know this month and i said why don't we investigate this question uh because we don't we don't know actually we don't know and it's and it comes up all the time uh you know how the worker bees choose which a gets the royal jelly which will then lead yeah of course to them being uh developing into a queen um i can so we we don't know which you know which causes a bee to, to, you know, pick that cell, you know, cell A versus B. Um, we do know that queen cups, for whatever reason, tend to be uh, producer royal jelly is being fed to, to uh, eggs or to larvae uh, towards the bottom of the comb. Um, so there's some spatial, um, you know, selection as well as um, pheromones. So they'll start to produce more uh, queens when the pheromone is weak. So that could be from an old queen or a sick queen, um, or if there's no queen at all, of course, there's no pheromones being produced from her. So those are some of the primary triggers for producing more of them, but we don't know, you know how they choose, so to speak. And it is the workers that control that. They're the ones that that feed feed the larvae, and um, there's a few bees that will tend to be producing the royal jelly. Say five, six bees that will continue to be around that cell and feed it uh, regularly. I see. So um, now, deviating from the queens, I have a question based on the social behavior more. Um, like as a mycology geek myself, I, <laughs> I have um, researched a bit on, um, you know, different kinds of fungi and etc. Uh -huh. And uh, th there is this, there was this very interesting um, species of fungi called cordyceps, where they would infiltrate the nervous system of a specific target animal. So I saw this in ants and wrote a bit about it, like the carpenter ants. Mm -hmm. And uh, what the carpenter ants would do that they would see these like behavioral changes on the ants and they would just um, push them out of the colony, send them out somewhere to die on the corner somewhere. So uh, with uh, the thing that you mentioned, um, like bees can sometimes lose self-control. And when they lose self-control, they sometimes deviate from their tasks, start to act selfish or, um, you know, cause a, some sort of hindrance in some of the mechanics of the hive. So how do the other, you know, um, self-conditioning, self-restraining bees react to the actions of such a bee within the hive? Do they take such uh, drastic measures such as the ants or what do they do? Um, so I'm trying to think, well, that's a good question. I don't, that's something I haven't investigated myself or haven't measured. Uh, I'm trying to think in, in the context, yeah, of, of a bee being 
affected or an individual being affected, there are certain responses that have been investigated. Um, so, but it's usually linked more to uh, thought to be adaptive responses to preventing transmission um, as opposed to kind of reacting to them being say lazy bees or, or selfish bees. Um, so that vitamin inquiry, I don't think has been really investigated that much. Um, I think, so with the infections, the bees or social individuals, whether they're bees or ants, it's, it's temp similar responses where they can, yeah, though they can avoid contact with them and, and quarantine them. They can, uh, sometimes they're aggressively attacked uh, and uh, kicked out of the, the hive or the colony. Um, and sometimes in cases, interactions increase. Uh, so there's more begging behavior uh, from the individual that's sick and uh, nest mates will feed them more. They'll do food exchange. So ants and bees can do this. Uh, so it's almost like a, um, they're providing you know, additional aid or support. Uh, so there's a number of responses and a lot of times that depends on, you know, it depends on the pathogen itself um, and pathogens will vary in their virulence and um, sometimes it's, you know, pathogen will change the, how the bee smells or the particular hydrocarbons, what the bee smells a lot. And then if that's the case, it's pretty, e you know, they can be detected, detected pretty easily as being different. So I think in some cases, the parasite changes the smell of the individual so much that they're recognized then as an intruder or foreigner. And that's why they're kicked out of the hive. Um, that's an interesting question in terms of, <clears throat> I did investigate um, bees. I did starve bees in a colony. I, I did look at social behavior in another project I didn't show here, um, but I didn't focus on the bees interacting with that bee. I just focused on the behaviors that bee was doing. So that would be interesting to investigate actually. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Sure. As of now, I do not see any hands raised or any other questions in the chat. So I think that uh, that's that was it. <laughs> okay, that's that's no problem. Well, okay. stop my share here. Well, okay. I think someone opened their microphone. Yeah, may I ask something? I forgot to raise hand. So okay, there you go. <laughs> Sure, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's going to be a rather simplistic question <laughs> compared to Sarpembra, but uh, I guess I'm just going to ask it. I mean, I'm not a science student. Uh, my department is economics, but still, I'm going to ask something about social constructions. So uh, it's going to be about, so, uh, you know, so let's think of a spectrum. And one side is individualistic behavior, and the other one is collectivist behavior. And when we look at it, insects such as bees and ants, tend to be more, you know, collectivists, while humans and other kind of mammals tend to be more individualist. Do you think that size can be a factor of this? Because, you know, insects are way smaller and mammals are bigger. I mean, does this have to have anything to do with size? Or if not, what does it have to do with, <laughs> like? Yeah, very good. Very interesting question. I, I'm thinking my, my brain is turning already. It's working. Um, thinking about it. Uh, very interesting question. Yeah, so, so you say you're from economics and actually behavioral ecology, the field of behavioral ecology, which is used to explain why animals do the things they do, the, uh, the whole framework is actually based off of economics. So I showed you that risk sensitivity theory um, is from, you know, taken from economics and actually instead of using money, we use the bee, uh, um, the animal's energy, or sometimes fitness instead as a currency, um, and determining how they might behave or predict how they might behave. Um, so that's just a side comment. But back to your question, um, I suppose it could because 
it would so, so I do argue this in my research that um, honeybees or yeah, like insects, like you mentioned, they don't they don't have as much room for storage for fat storage, energy storage, which limits their um, buffering capacity on an individual level, right? And so therefore they might be more reliant upon their nest mates. So the bees and ants, for example, share food among each other and they build up food stores and things. And so they may be, could be more reliant upon that, or at least they don't have the means to buffer against energetic stress. So in that, in that um, you know, context, I think, I think yes, that, that size might matter in this case, um, where, you know, even though humans are highly social, we can afford to, for example, you know, be on our own more because we can have the, the fat storage or, or other mammals that are social. Um, and you certainly, you only see one case in mammals that are eusocial. So at the same level of sociality that you see with bees and ants, and that's the naked mole rat. So there's, <clears throat> that's the only example. Um, and there's kind of three different criteria that they need to meet in order to be eusocial. So we're not even as social as, as bees. So they are doing a lot of actions that are, um, they're functioning with what sometimes they're termed as a super organism. So they're, they're analogous to like how the tissues of our body work together to, to sustain an individual collectively. Um, bees are, as a colony, are like functioning like a unit, like a, a, an, an organism itself. Um, and so we do see that a lot with, with the insects. This, this, you see more examples in the insects. So, so you could be onto something. I don't think that's a good, you know, it'd be really interesting to see in the literature if that might be the case, you know, if you start to see a trend there. Thank you for the answer. Sure, yeah, thanks for the question. Okay. Any others? You okay? Not seeing any others at the moment. Maybe I can just ask one more. <laughs> and then I, I can satiate my need. Um, so re recalling back to your like initial hypothesis on the adipose um, hormones, like uh, the adipose accumulating hormone. What, what, what is it called again? AKTC? Yeah, yeah, the um, adipokinetic hormone, it's, it's abbreviated AKH, yeah. Okay, so AKH. I, 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 I fairly recall that in your introduction to your hypothesis, you say that um, it was more favored for a more socially um, evolved being to direct itself towards more activity through the other uh, hormone. Uh, rather than it uh, focusing on the adipokinetic uh, pathway, so to say. Um, what, what, like, um, through which uh, evolutionary perspective um, did you come up with such a hypothesis? Like, um, what was the building blocks of the argument? I very much wonder that. Yeah, I, so I came up with this um, for my postdoc. So I wrote, uh, a, a fellowship application um, for um, for Germany, um, the Alexander von Humboldt program, and, and so you have to come up with your own idea. And so I went, I went through the literature, and I just, you know, I know I saw some literature that showed evidence that 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 this could be true, but wasn't tested. That they've lost. Um, there's some evidence, like at a molecular level, that they probably lost function of this adipokinetic hormone and um, in honeybees. And then it was like more dramatic in honeybees versus bumblebees. And then I saw, I knew that, you know, octopamine would be likely to be increased, although it wasn't tested explicitly either in honeybees. And then I was, so that got me thinking, well, maybe there's this dichotomy and 
from what I can tell, these are the two major pathways that are elicited in, in response to hunger. Um, and so um, based on what I found, I thought, okay, you know, if I put these, these together, um, what, would I, what would I expect to see? And, um, and so, yeah, so it's something that was commented on as being, you know, quite like different and original um, but I just kept, you know, reading the literature and things and thinking about it and thinking about, you know, what can we learn about social behavior because bees are a good model organism for it. Uh, so that was in, in mind too. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, oh, there is a question in the chat. So Elif Bashar asks, can I ask how do you keep bees in a lab environment? Is maintaining them hard? Uh-huh. Interesting question. Yeah. So um, for most of my work, I actually um, harness them and I use a plastic drinking straw for this. And I cut it into just you know different pieces. And I, and I use a small strip of duct tape. And uh, so these bees are what you saw there in the video um, with the training. So they're immobilized, but their head is free. And it allows me for at least to measure their appetite. I can measure if their head is free like that, but I don't have to worry about them flying or stinging people in the lab. Um, so that's one common method if you wanna do stuff at the individual level and then <clears throat> There's the observation hive, which is harder to maintain, but so you can, what you saw there with the stop signals, that's basically three frames stacked on top of each other with two glass windows. And um, we actually had to open up the observation hive inside uh, in order to get the audio recordings. And so that meant bees flying everywhere in a room and I had to, we had to wear bee veils, although we rarely, if any, would get stung. Um, so that, that was, you know, more messy and, and, and a lot more effort to kind of, to do and, um, but it's what the experiment required. And then um, lastly, there's the option to keep them in cages, um, which is, you know, fairly easy, but you have less control, right? And so you can, um, for example, keep them in a cage in the incubator and they can last a fairly long time. Um, and you can say, you know, starve them or something like that, or um, there's different applications, but, but that's the other kind of main tool that we use. Yeah. And a very interesting little fact too, I was, um, you know, a visitor for a small amount of time in the adjacent lab to Professor Mayex. And there were always uh, like um, papers with writings on them saying live bees inside, <laughs> <laughs> approach with caution, or keep out. <laughs> so it, it was always wonderful to see. So there is also another question. Uh, uh -huh. um, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. From Alperan Basharan, they said, uh, sir, I'd like to know if social behavior among animals is a spe specialization ex exclusive for some species or a trait common in our genes. There are self-isolating animals such as leopards and blue whales, etc., And there are many animals as bees and humans. And, I will, uh, and that's what I wondered. Okay. Yeah, yeah, another uh, interesting question. Um, that is, that's, that's what everyone, I think, or a lot of people, a lot of scientists in the field are, that's what they're really interested in right now. And, and, you know, is there some, you know, special gene that, that, uh, you know, will facilitate or give rise to social behavior? Um, I think, I think what's more, what, so, so from what we know is, you know, social behaviors evolved independently in, multiple contexts with multiple species in multiple environments. And so um, it's, it's going to be quite rare to find, you know, one particular gene that's, that's, you know, 
the cause for social behavior. Um, instead, um, although there have been a few key genes that have been identified, say in Drosophila, for example, that you have more control and can, can study things more closely that seem to be key to you know, producing more social behavior. So there are, at the same time, a few key genes that have been, that have been identified, yes, that, that relate more to social behavior. But at the same time, there's also a lot of differences and you know, many genes and behavior is by nature a complex trait a complex uh, continuous trait, which means that from a genetic standpoint, there's gonna be multiple genes that dictate that behavior. Um, social behavior is you know, considered to be a complex, a complex behavior, not a, not a simple innate behavior. So um, what's more likely as yeah, many genes, many different genes, and probably there are different genes that can facilitate it um, that can be modified independently of one another to give rise to the social behavior. Um, so it's fairly, it's a, it's a hard question to answer. And, and I think that's why, you know, we're, we're act, there's a lot of active research in the area uh, still. Yeah. Okay. So um, let me see if there are any hands raised. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be any, and there aren't any other questions in the chat. So it's okay. I, I really enjoyed chatting with all you. You had great questions. Um, I really enjoyed the discussion. Well, um, I, I believe if I can speak on the behalf of, of all others, <laughs> well, we, I, I believe we did as well. So it, it was a very um, kind of you to come accept our invitation and uh, provide us the much needed insight about uh, you know this uh, area of expertise of yours like um, we very much aim to uh, discuss different topics related to biology and I think yours was an integral part in uh, achieving that aim so thank you very much for coming to our seminar, for being yeah, involved in this. Um, so much for the, um, the invitation. And I just, I just want to point out as a final note that Turkey is a special place for bees. They, they have the most beekeepers per capita in the world. Um, and so, you know, it's, it has a strong history here and um, hopefully I'll see, we'll see more bee researchers in the future. Uh, from your generation that are coming up through the ranks, um, you know, studying here in Turkey because it is, it's a special place for bees. They have high, high amount of bee diversity here in Turkey, both wild bees and honeybees and um, a lot of beekeeping activity. So, all right, with that, I'll that let you was, go. <laughs> that was a wonderful closing note, by the way.